Okay, hello everyone and welcome to another lecture of W102. In today's lecture, I'm going to talk a little bit more about applications. But before I do so, just some quick announcements. Your final exam, as uh, you should hopefully know by now, is out on June 3rd at 8 a.m. and it's due on June 4th. So it's the same exact policy as we had for the midterm exam, open note, open internet, you know, whatever. This particular lecture is not covered on the final. Uh, today we're going to discuss a little bit more in terms of applications. A little bit about Laplace transform, in particular how to apply it. And non-ideal filters. It's just a primer to get you ready for the future classes that you might take in this domain. So I'm going to start right off with an uh, application from my group. So this is a new share here. So this is a video. And in this video, what you should see is, let me just play the video, make sure it's sharing. Good. So here we have a video of a human being. And this video is being captured at a distance, uh, non-contact. And the goal here is to contribute to actually COVID relief efforts. Uh, we're trying to extract out the vital signs from this human being so that we can measure the heart rate, the pulse, uh, other parameters that a doctor might be interested in. So for example, if you are uh, today, 70% of medical visits are happening via telemedicine, where you're basically having a Zoom interview with your physician. And it's very useful to know if the patient should come in if the physician was able to get feedback on the heart rate, the breathing, and other types of vital signs that are critical. So our goal in this project uh, is to actually end up estimating the pulse or the heart rate of the human being uh, based on video streams. So in this particular example, you have a, a patient who's, or a person who is sitting here, and they're hooked up to an ECG to get ground truth, electrocardiogram, which uh, uses electrical leads to actually measure the uh, impulses that are going to the heart. And so that gives you this rhythmic oscillation pattern. And now our goal is from video to get a very different peaks and oscillations uh, of, uh, of pulse corresponding to slight motion and twitches that we make every time blood pumps. So let me play the video. On the bottom is the ground truth. On the top here, is our result where we're trying to extract out the beats per minute of the heart. And in this particular example, we're looking at these tiny wiggles on motion and then doing Fourier analysis on that to extract out a periodic signal. And if we actually, even though the signal kind of looks like garbage, even if we were able to do a Fourier transform on the signal, we would see a very strong uh, spectral component at the oscillation frequency of the ECG. And so what that tells us is that the data this 54 beats per minute or so is actually embedded in the video stream. And one of the projects that my group is currently working on is ways to remotely extract that with a non-contact sensor. So this is just an example of how we can extract signal processing that we learned in 1D to three dimensions, right? We have a video, which is two dimensions of space and time, and we're essentially doing a three-dimensional Fourier transform. So there's a lot of power that happens when we are able to master the fundamentals of signals and systems. All right. So back to the lecture, we just discussed one particular application Uh, video for health. And this is a project that my students are working on with uh, some UCLA physicians at the medical school. All right, so last time you may remember that we were discussing Laplace transforms. Okay, the slide has not updated yet. All right, uh, bear with me a moment. All right, 
stop mirroring. Okay, sorry about that. Looks like Zoom had frozen for a moment. So let's take a look at this uh, example just as a warm up from last time. Uh, this is nothing new. We have a, a ordinary differential equation here, a triple derivative of v minus v of t equals zero. And so our goal here is to actually solve for what the form of v of t is. Now, dealing with differential and integral calculus can be difficult. So one of the things that we might do is take a Laplace transform. So let's assume that we have some initial conditions to solve this differential equation. So initial conditions are v of 0 equals 1, v prime of 0 equals 0, v double prime equals 0. So we have these initial conditions, and based on these initial conditions, we want to solve a differential equation. Our first step, perhaps, is to take a Laplace transform, because a Laplace transform will convert this into an algebraic form of equation. So a Laplace transform will give us the following. So I take a Laplace transform. Let's uh, rearrange this. So Laplace transform of v triple prime of t. We'll just move the v of t to one side and then take a Laplace transform of both sides. So right here, this is equal to x cubed s minus s squared v of 0 s prime of 0 minus v double prime of 0. And this equals s cubed s minus s squared. All right, so we have the Laplace transform of the blue term. Uh, and the Laplace transform of the red term, right, if we were to rearrange this here, the full Laplace transform, we have s cubed v of s minus s squared. So that's just right over here. Minus. v of s equals 0. And if we rearrange this algebraically, we get v of s equals s squared over s cubed minus 1. So now we have the Laplace transform for v. And so we simply need to take an inverse Laplace transform to actually get back to v of t. So if we do an inverse Laplace transform, the answer that we end up getting for v of t is as follows. And this occurs for positive values of t. So if you like, you can go ahead and try to take v of t, uh, capital V of s, right here, and see if you can end up converting this with an inverse Laplace transform to get the form for v of t. So this is just a warm up of how we have a pretty, uh, at least straightforward in theory, procedure to solve differential equations, as long as we're willing to do some pretty hairy algebra to get the inverse Laplace transform. All right, now, assuming that we have a good handle on Laplace transforms, inverting Laplace transforms, and so on, the next question that might be raised is, what are some practical applications of Laplace transforms beyond just maybe circuits and or finding differential equation solutions? Well, 
the practical applications for Laplace transforms are basically wherever you have differential equations. Here's one particular example uh, in mechanical engineering. So uh, assume that you have a car and it's got a suspension. It's got uh, like, uh, if you look at your shock absorber for a car, it's got kind of the shock absorber, which is this damper here. Uh, this is a damper. You have a mass, which is the vehicle body that sits on top of it. And then you have a spring. So you have this mass spring damper system. And the dynamics of the vehicle uh, can be modeled with a function. Uh, imagine that x is the road height. It's how high kind of like that mass is, is going. Uh, x is sort of the height of the road. And you know the road can be flat or it can have a bump. And in response to an input road height, you want to see what the output vehicle height is. So the input to the system, so you have a car suspension. And what the car suspension does, it modulates some function of the road's height and time versus, so this goes in, y of t, which is the car's height. You can imagine that if we didn't have any type of uh, spring or damper, then it would just be a one-to-one -one mapping. If I increase the road height by you know five units, five centimeters or whatever, then the car is going to move up by five centimeters like a step function. However, if I have some damping elements like a spring, a deformable shock absorber, then there's a more complicated relationship between x and y, which actually takes a differential equation form. Now, you don't need to know how to derive this equation. It's a standard equation for mechanical engineering. But this differential equation describes the input relationship between x and y. Now, we have this uh, dynamical system for the, the vehicle. And what we might want to do is we might want to understand what is the transfer function of the system. Uh, how would the system respond to like a curb? If I were to drive the vehicle on a curb, that's like a step function in response. So how would the output car height respond to a curb or something similar? So uh, let's set some constants for like the spring constant, like the, the stiffness of the spring. Uh, how active the damper is, how viscous the damper is, and what the mass of the car is. So that's just setting these three constants right here. So don't worry about the units for now. So we have these three constants, and we want to solve for, let's say, a step response, where x of t equals u of t, uh, the car is driving on a curve. Our first step is to understand the transfer function of the system, h of s. Remember that the transfer function of a system is also equal to Right? So we have this for the transfer function from our basics of Laplace transforms and LTI systems. So if I look at my previous equation, remember that my previous equation looks something like this. My double prime plus By prime plus Ky equals Bx prime plus Kx. All right, so I have this equation for the dynamics of the vehicle, the vehicle dynamics. Now, uh, what I want to do is I have an expression for y and x. So it's, of course, it's in differential equation form. I want to solve for capital Y of s over x of s. And as you know from Laplace transforms, uh, we can simply take a Laplace transform and get that ratio. Uh, here's that ratio. It's shown right over here. OK, so this is that ratio. And you can kind of, uh, this differential equation is kind of simple enough that you can almost do it in your head, uh, right? So we have a, a single prime here. So you know that you're going to keep the, you're going to have a s to the power of 1 times b. And you have uh, x in the primal form. So k would just be a constant there. So you have bs plus k in the numerator. And you have ms squared plus bs plus k in the denominator by applying similar analysis to the left-hand side. It does, if this doesn't make sense, maybe you want to pause the video and just try out the algebra for a moment. OK, so let's assume that we have this form for the transfer function. Now, the next step is we're also given uh, some constants. So b and k and m, the mass of the car, are known to us. So we can sort of put those constants in. So remember that b is 3. So this would be 3s. k is 2. 3s plus 2 divided by m is 1 s 
squared plus, again, b is 3, so 3s plus 2. Okay, so 3s plus 2 over s squared plus 3s plus 2. So now we have a form for the transfer function. And as we have discussed so often, uh, the transfer function, it, it just so happens that in many engineering systems, as we'll see later in this lecture, either mechanical engineering, differential equations, or circuits, uh, h takes the form of a rational sort of expression that can be written as a ratio of two polynomials. And once we have it in a ratio of two polynomials, it's often better to write it in terms of the zeros and poles. So in this particular case, uh, I already have kind of a good expression for the zeros on the top, but on the bottom, I can actually factor that. So 3s plus 2 divided by s plus 1, s plus 2. So now I have an expression for the transfer function. And remember that my goal of this exercise, understand not the impulse response, but I want to understand the step response. So the step response, the way I would solve that, so my solution here is given the transfer function, and since the step response is x, right, x is the step function, so if x is u of t, then x of s is also given, right, it's just 1 over s, then I can calculate in the frequency domain the output. or in this particular place uh, in the Laplace domain. Is y of s equals h of s times x of s. So y of s is nothing but 3s plus 2 over s plus 1, s plus 2, which is h, times 1 over s, all right? I'm just going to put this s here. This simplifies to 1 over s plus 1 over s plus 1 minus 2 over s plus 2. So now we can see that this form right here this is in the catalog. So since it's in the Laplace catalog, I can simply look up my tables to get the inverse Laplace transform. I don't need to do any hairy algebra. And I can obtain 1 plus e to the minus t minus 2e to the minus 2t. Okay, so now I have an expression for y of t that I've solved for. I've actually gotten my output. So I understand what the step response is. So if my car actually goes over a curb, and that curb is the height, right, that's the x of t, then the y of t is not going to be a step function. It's going to be whatever this is. So now it's useful to plot what y of t is. So if I go over a curb, if I sort of go over a bump, uh, ordinarily I would expect something like this. I would expect if I didn't have any dampers, it might be kind of a jarring transition there. But instead, with the damper, what I end up getting is I get kind of this smoother roll off uh, and overcorrection, as we would ex expect when you have shocks and springs, you actually overcorrect. So we actually go more than an amplitude of unity, more than an amplitude of one. And then we slowly correct back down as the oscillations uh, dissipate. And so in this particular case, there are some intuitions that we can sort of check here. So first of all, this dashed line here, the dashed line is x of t. So eventually at time t equals infinity, as you would expect, the car is at a height of one, right? Uh, way out on the right, the car is at the height of one. Some other intuitions. The car, when it first hits the curb, there's some like transient, there's a rise time to this, it takes some time for the car's level to reach the height of the curb because the suspension system is damping it, right? Uh, as the car moves along, 
the wheels go up, but the car body stays in the same position. So in this particular case, that's why we see a slower rise time than a step function. After that, the car overshoots uh, because once the spring contracts, it kind of pops the vehicle back up. So it kind of overcorrects. And then instead of oscillating back and forth like a spring would do, the damper actually works now in concert to make sure those oscillations effectively go down to zero. So uh, we end up not oscillating forever. So in this way, the mass, the spring, and the damper work together in harmony. And this is uh, this example is underpins how car suspension systems are designed, but also buildings. So this is also used in buildings for earthquake proofing. So they again model the buildings as a mass. And underneath, they may also have in series, they may have a spring and they may have a damper in series. Right? So this is your building, which could be Royce Hall. All right. Now, because we've obtained an expression for uh, how the car is going to respond with respect to a step function, now we can do some interesting things with the functional form. I can try to play around with the constants. And if I'm a suspension designer, I can see what is the ideal spring stiffness to use, what is the ideal uh, magnitude of the shock absorbance that I want. And so, for example, if I were to change the shock absorbance to uh, the spring to k equals 5 and the shock absorbance to b equals 2, that constant for kind of the viscosity of the shock, then you end up, again, you can just, now that we have h, we simply need to multiply that by the step function. So uh, all you need to do is plug in those new constants for uh, k and b in that functional form for s, uh, for h, and then multiply by x. So when you multiply by x, you now get this new expression for y of s. Now we have y of s, we want to get it back into the catalog so that we can uh, essentially do a, um, a Laplace transform. So these are some algebraic man manipulations to take capital Y to get it in the catalog form. And if you just use that lookup table or the catalog, the inverse Laplace transform is shown here this new equation. And if I plot that against the previous curve in green that I had before, changing these constants kind of causes this larger overcorrection from the spring. I actually see this ripple here, right here of an oscillation. And that's because I've reduced the dampening, right? I've changed B to equal two instead of three. So I have a stiffer spring and less damper. And so now I have actually this oscillation that shows up. So kind of the old style suspensions that you see in 80s cars and maybe movies like Die Hard or whatever, you'll see kind of like this very weird, it goes over a speed bump, it just oscillates and creaks for a few, uh, a few moments. And that's because back in the day, the dampers actually used to use their, lose their dampening over time pretty quickly. All right. So uh, in this particular case, we've used the Laplace transform to look at one particular practical example of differential equation analysis. We're going to move to another practical topic that we didn't touch on in the main lectures, which is filtering. So in the previous lectures, we kind of assumed that the filters were really good, right? We assumed that the filters were really good and that the frequency response H of J omega of the system uh, was maybe ideal like a brick wall or so on. There are two sort of caveats here. The first caveat to be aware of is that filters are not ideal. And when you actually implement filters uh, in the mechanical engineering or the uh, electrical engineering of things, you may not be able to work in the domain of Fourier analysis. For various reasons, you might be dealing with signals and systems that uh, sort of lend credence to using a Laplace transform. For example, J omega might not be in the region of convergence. So, how do we physically realize implementable filters? Well, for this, we study the Laplace transform and then we typically project to the complex plane of J omega. So Laplace transform 
So I'll sort of explain what this means uh, without jargon using a concrete example. First, ideal filters and non-ideal filters. Uh, previously, we spoke about low-pass, high-pass filters, and we kind of assumed they were a rec function like this. In reality, that's not the case. You actually typically will have some sort of uh, sigmoidal shape here, where you have a transition region. So let me kind of draw it so it aligns. So here you have a transition region around here. And this is the passband. And here's the cutoff, right? It starts cutting off here. So in this particular case, I've shown some filters, uh, low pass, high pass, band pass that we talked about earlier. There's also a filter that we have not talked about much called the notch filter or band stop. And this is very useful because what it does is it rejects uh, specific frequencies that you don't want. So one example where this is used is in cameras. In cameras, you take a video, uh, very often in fluorescent lights, we don't see it as humans, but the fluorescent lights, if you have fluorescent lights, are often oscillating at the electrical line voltage. So you might have uh, oscillation at 120 hertz, for example. And so if you have a camera, the camera will actually be confused by those 120 hertz. Uh, even if you have a low frame rate camera, it'll actually alias. The 120 hertz will actually alias back down. So you're gonna have this, um, uh, effect where you want to filter out 120 hertz. So let's imagine that we had a high-speed camera that's capturing sports photography. So we want to capture all the possible temporal frequencies of movement. Uh, this could be, you know, someone shooting a basketball really fast, moving their hand really fast, swimming, you know, very fast periodic motion of the arms. So we want these high frequencies to pass through because that's sports photography. We also want regular frequencies to pass through, you know, just small, slow motions. But very specifically, it turns out that we want to avoid interference at, let's say, 120 hertz for the fluorescent lights. And so we would kill those frequencies, and that's called a notch filter, a band stop filter. Another filter that uh, is worth mentioning is an all-pass filter. Sometimes you use this to debug your circuits, right? So that's when you use an all-pass filter. Uh, if you look, uh, using some of these filters in, uh, in sequence can get you sort of what you need. For example, if you lose low pass and high pass filter together and their cutoff frequencies are different, you can actually get uh, a notch filter, right? So you can actually combine uh, low pass. So you can sort of combine this and this if you wanted to essentially get a uh, notch filter. All right. So uh, when we talk about non-ideal filters, I'll just zoom in, kind of double click on uh, a low pass filter here. So on the slide, hopefully it updates, you should be seeing a non-ideal low pass filter. It looks like Zoom has frozen again, so please give me a moment. All right, great. So non-ideal filters. So here's the low pass filter, and these are the different regions that we sort of talked about. Uh, the first region is called a pass band, right? These are low frequencies below what's called the cutoff frequency, cutoff frequency here, where these frequencies pass through the system. There's a transition band, which has some duration. Ideally, we would not want a transition band. We want our filters typically to be sharp in, in many applications, but we may have a transition band shown here, which uh, has a kind of a smooth decay um, up until you reach the stop band frequency where the stop begins. When the stop band be begins, you're not gonna pass any of those frequencies through. Uh, we also have these cutoffs. These can be heuristics where they can be set to specific industry specific values uh, known as uh, GP is uh, the value that tells us what it means to be a frequency that's sufficiently well passed through. So you can imagine that uh, for a different standard, a less 
uh, a less, a more relaxed standard, I could have GP being here. I, I could say that anything at 50% of the max value is considered passed through. So there are a lot of value, uh, a lot of um, uh, potential options for what you choose. It's just a constant. Here I've chosen it to be fairly strict, where the uh, where the passband is shown as a sufficiently large value. All right. So in previous lectures, we talked about filters in terms of their frequency response, like were they recs or convolution of recs. And these are typically ideal filters that are not implementable. So real-time filters need to be implemented as an analog or a discrete circuit. So one way to think about why a rect function is not implementable, because a filter in the frequency domain that's a rect, so if it's a rect in the frequency domain, so here's j omega. So here I have my frequency domain and it's a rect, perfect rect. Now what's gonna happen is that this filter has finite duration in the frequency domain. And if I take this Fourier transform, so I take an inverse Fourier transform, I'm actually gonna get a sync. So here's your Broadcom logo. Now this is my time domain signal. Now, the sync function shown here is the Broadcom logo, sure, but that Broadcom logo, I haven't drawn the full width of it. It actually extends out to plus and minus infinity. And it's gonna be very hard uh, for us to design a time domain system that exists for time infinity. Uh, imagine you were designing a filter that if you put in some uh, impulse into it, it would keep ringing and ringing and ringing like a bell for time infinity. So that's kind of not implementable. So what ends up happening usually is that circuits implement what's called rational operations or rational functions. Uh, you can just see this in the definition of Ohm's law, right? Uh, very often you end up with ratios of constants and terms. So it's useful then to design and analyze rational functions if one is trying to characterize the frequency response or the transfer function. So here on the bottom is this equation H of S shown here, where H of S is going to be some rational, uh, written as a ratio of two polynomials. Uh, it's uh, polynomial B over polynomial of A. And as we learned before, the zeros of the numerator polynomial are called the zeros of H. And you know whatever leads to a zero in the denominator is called the poles of H. So zeros in the numerator are zeros, zeros in the denominator are poles. So you've got zeros and poles now for my transfer function. So it's the same transfer function as before, but let's just assume as it turns out to be the case for most real world systems that we are concerned with, that it can be written as a fractional form with zeros and poles. Okay, so this is still very general. So now that I have zeros and poles, I can maybe think of some mathematical analysis to characterize the frequency domain. And this analysis is something you'll learn more in follow-up classes called a Bode plot. A uh, Bode plot is named after a famous engineer at Bell Labs, and it quantifies how the magnitude and phase of the transfer function change with frequency. The Bode plot plot is an industry standard. So today, if I'm implementing a chip or if I'm implementing a camera or an optical solution or anything related to either my research or teaching, I would not design my own filter, right? People have solved the problem of making low pass filters. So I would go to a catalog of low pass filters and I would select one, they might be like 67 cents or whatever, and they would be shipped to me and I would plug that into my circuit. Now, how do I choose which filter to buy? Well, sure, they can tell me the cutoff frequency and the stop band where it is, but that's actually not really that informative. Uh, I need to also understand how sharp is that transition region, right? How sharp is that decay? Do I have ripples in my frequency transform? Um, and these kind of phenomena cannot be quantified with qu constants. It can really only be quantified by Bode plots. So Bode plots take that function capital H and they allow you to pl plot both the magnitude and phase on a log scale. And here's that e equation here. On the left-hand side is the y-axis of the Bode plot, right? This is in decibels. So you have the y-axis of the Bode plot, and if you look at just the previous expression for capital H, I've actually taken a logarithm of that expression, and that's given me this 
right-hand side expression here, shown here. Okay, so I've taken that logarithm. Now, when I've taken that logarithm, what it's done is we know that when I divide, like if I take the log of a divided by b, that gives me log of a minus log of b. So what you have here is you have kind of the zeros and the poles are written in an additive form here for capital H. I think the writing is sort of lagging a little bit behind. I don't know why this is happening, but it is. So there's some, uh, Zoom kind of instituted this mandatory update today, June 1st, uh, that I could not get out of. And this mandatory update has kind of uh, led to a lot of uh, problems with recording lectures as well as just host hosting regular meetings. So I apologize that the text is not coming in, but essentially, uh, if you just pause the video and look at the previous equation and look at this equation, you can see that the zeros and the poles are now in additive form, right? Or really it's subtractive. So now let's check our understanding if we look at this. If, the, if we're at a frequency that is close to a pole, then H is just gonna blow up, right? Because a pole is a zero of the denominator. If you divide by zero, you get infinity. So if omega is at a pole, you get a very large value here. If omega is at a zero, you get a zero value. So by that logic, as you move away from poles, you get smaller. And as you move away from zeros, you typically get larger. So that's what kind of we intuitively expect. So let's take a look at the phase now. On the next slide, all right. On the next slide, all right, I think I've got to just keep resharing it slide by slide. All right. So now, just like we were in additive form for magnitude we also have kind of an additive form for phase. Uh, we don't need to worry about taking the logarithm here in the same way, because remember the phase is already additive. Um, when I divide two complex exponentials by each other, I'm actually subtracting their phases. And when I multiply them, I'm adding their phases. We won't go too much into phase in this lecture, just to keep it a little bit more intuitive, but feel free to kind of uh, look at the phase plots that I'm going to also display on the slides and see if it correlates to your understanding of this equation. So if you're, if you can kind of really grasp the magnitude uh, stuff that I'm explaining, feel free to just uh, think in your head about how it applies to the phase plots I'm going to show as well. All right, so we're going to start with magnitude. Uh, if we take the magnitude of H, the transfer function, and plug in uh, S equals J omega, you end up with this here, right? Now, in this representation, I've explicitly plugged in S equals J omega. Let's not worry about if this is physically realizable, right? J omega might not be in the region of convergence, but let's not worry about that right now. Let's assume that we can do that just for intuitive understanding. So in this particular case, uh, as before, we see that H of J omega gets big when J omega is near a pole, and it gets small when J omega is near a zero. Once again, that's what we would expect. So here's an example filter. Uh, I'll first just present this filter, sketch it over, and then we'll go through a simpler filter before building up to this example. This is just how a body plot looks. This is online and you can go ahead and play with the online tool. But basically what it is, is it, it's a two zero two pole filter. Uh, and what it does is it has, actually passes through high frequencies. It's a high pass filter. So you can see in the body plot, the y-axis here is the magnitude of the transfer function, but that magnitude is in decibels, right? Um, and the horizontal axis x is just uh, our friendly frequency, in this case, j omega. Now, sometimes the frequency will be plotted in a log scale. Sometimes it'll be plotted uh, directly. Typically, body plot is log log, but I've often seen, depending on the frequency range that one is using, Sometimes some data sheets and, and people will not plot the horizontal axis in log, but the vertical axis will always be 
plotting log for a body plot. Now, the body plot in general is, even though my circuit might be a Laplace transform, it might be modeled more as a Laplace transform, uh, typically we cannot put in, we, it's hard to physically realize uh, at, you know, values of S where sigma is non-zero. So typically we actually end up trying to reduce it to a Fourier transform uh, to actually look at where sigma equals zero. So the Bode plot is that cross section or that projection, right? If you see sigma, sigma is zero. So the Bode plot here is the projection of the transfer function H of S to H of J omega. So the Bode plot is typically taken with J omega here rather than S. All right, so now let's look at a filter design example. This is a simple filter and we'll work bottom up. We'll quickly make the filters more complicated, but let's assume that we have some circuit that gives us one of the simplest possible transfer functions, one over S plus A, okay, with A being positive. So intuitively, what would the Bode plot look like? So before I uh, show the Bode plot, let's take a look at the intuition here. In this particular case, the transfer function is written in the form of S. So remember, S kind of is like J omega uh, for Bode plot analysis. And if S is in the denominator, uh, we're dealing with a pole here. That's, and there's only one pole. So that's why this is called a single pole filter. So if it's a single pole filter, what does that mean? Well, that means that when S equals minus A, this is going to blow up. But another way to think about it is, let's say S is zero. Let's say S was really small. Let's say S was the zero frequency, like a DC component. When you do with filters, rather than looking at it mathematically for when the function blows up or not, the first thing that one might ask is, if I put omega equals zero, what do I get? That omega equals zero is also known as the DC component. So if omega equals zero, then I get h of s equals one, all right? So the transfer function is one, which means that I'm kind of passing those frequencies, right? I'm passing those frequencies through, uh, and that would be in the pass band typically, if omega equals zero. So I'm passing the DC component through. But now as S gets higher and higher and higher, what's gonna happen? Well, as S reaches a really high value, uh, as you get further away from the pole, as we spoke about before, your H is gonna drop in magnitude. So you're not gonna pass those frequencies. So when omega approaches you know, very large values, let's just write infinity here, I am gonna be at high frequencies, and h would be equal to zero. So this filter is passing the DC component through, and it's killing the high frequencies. And the higher I get, the more it kills it. So this filter would therefore be a low-pass filter. So I would expect the Bode plot to essentially have uh, one, 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 and then I it would, as the frequencies go higher, it would start to decay. So let's take a look at the body plot. Okay. All right, so now we have our same transfer function written here. H of S equals one plus S over A. And if I look at the body plot, what I see is that here I have some cutoff frequency And this cutoff frequency right here is when that high pass stop, when that high, that, as I'm starting to get in a transition region, that's when it, where it's happening. It's happening right here. It's happening right here. And if I look at the value here, it's 10 to the zero, which is omega equals one hertz. Right, so right over here, I'm getting into the uh, transition, I'm starting to now kill frequencies at omega equals one hertz. And that's what I'd expect. Now, as you can see, the magnitude goes down, down, and down. So in general, the way to read this is zero, a magnitude of zero for the transfer function uh, is really good. That means that you're effectively like one, that your value is 
basically one. Okay, at, at zero, your value is effectively one. Uh, remember what the log of one is, right? Um, now, as you go lower in magnitude here, minus 10 decibels lower, minus 20 decibels lower, minus 10, minus 20, minus 30, minus 40, minus 50, minus 60. So as I start to go lower in magnitude, I'm starting to kill the signal by orders of magnitude. In this particular case, since I've multiplied by 20, it's a 20 log 10, every 20 dB I go down, I'm gonna kill my signal by a factor of 10x. So 40 dB attenuation is two orders of magnitude attenuation in this transfer function. So if it's originally one, now it's 0 0.01, right? And I can just keep going down. And so this is a log scale, even though it's written as like minus 60, that's three orders of magnitude, it's one one thousandth the signal, right? Minus 80 is one ten thousandth the signal. So the log plot allows us to very easily plot large scaling deviations in the y-axis here. All right, so here we have our cutoff frequency. So the single pole filter is far from ideal because it has this large transition band, but eventually it gets going and it starts to attenuate high frequencies. Uh, at the cutoff frequency, uh, omega c equals a, that's when it really starts to kick in. Attenuation occurs with a slope, meaning that higher frequencies are attenuated more. And this slope here is about 20 dB per decade of frequencies. So if I increase the frequency by an order of magnitude, then I'm gonna decrease uh, based on this plot by about 20 dB, which is an order of magnitude. So order of magnitude increase in frequency, order of magnitude decrease in the transfer function. So 10x the frequency, 10x the attenuation. So in this particular case, 20 dB attenuation is uh, characteristic, right? It's, it, it's kind of characteristic of a single pole system because each pole contributes 20 dB attenuation. If you remember the equation for the, for the log and the magnitude that we showed earlier. So in this particular case, 20 dB is kind of the most we can get out of this. And uh, not less important to this lecture, we can discuss in office hours on Thursday, we can discuss phase shift, but let's really try to master attenuation in this lecture. Uh, magnitude attenuation. All right, so now uh, you know, you're, you're designing a filter at work and your boss comes to you and says, you know what, I don't like this roll off here. This roll off here, is not steep enough. I want you to make it a lot steeper. So you go back and you say, all right, well, this is all I'm gonna get with a single pole filter. By definition with a single pole, because I have a factor of 20 there in the log, uh, I'm gonna be increasing, uh, decreasing by 20 dB a decade in frequency. So what do you do? Well, since if you remember the equation, I'll just point it out again. The equation here was, here you have a 20 log 10 j omega minus e minus 20 log 10 j omega minus p by. So if I look at this region right here, where the poles are, there's a summation over n, so I have n poles. So if I wanna kill the signal even more, I can actually start to add additional poles, right? If I add another pole, then I might be able to get 40 uh, decibels down per decade. So let's take a look. Let's take a look at a two pole low pass filter. So here I'm gonna make two poles. The poles are gonna have about the same magnitude, right? This is a magnitude of uh, root two. So the transfer function here uh, looks something like the following. Uh, these are the, the poles are minus one plus or minus j. So you can see that they're zeros of the denominator. And now if I look at the Bode plot, the Bode plot has a couple of subtleties. The cutoff frequency has shifted slightly. It's really almost imperceptible, but the cutoff frequency has shifted slightly rightwards to you know, nearly 1.1 1 .1 and a half hertz uh, instead of one hertz. But we're not so worried about that. Right? That's a really small difference. But very importantly, what we've done is we've attenuated at 40 decibels per decade. So now we've doubled the slope of the attenuation in the log-log plot. And we've done that by having two poles. Okay. So we can increase the number of poles to increase the slope of the Bode plot, but we can also move the poles around. So if we move the poles closer to the J omega axis, right? So in this place, let's uh, say that 
the poles are located at minus 0.1 plus or minus j, here's my transfer function. What intuitively should happen to the Bode plot? Well, what happens here is now, if you have sigma being zero or, or close to zero, this is highly dependent. The attenuation is highly dependent on omega. So what that means is close, very close to this axis, you have a peak here where the pole shows up. So you can kind of just uh, visualize this with this new denominator to see that as you move the pole close to the j omega axis, what's going to happen is you're going to have a spike at the j omega axis because when j omega is zero, uh, previously the s was kind of dampening it, right? By having a sigma that was kind of dampening uh, this effect because when omega was zero, s was still one. Now, uh, when omega is zero, s is 0.1, which gives me a very small number in the, uh, in, in the denominator, which allows, which actually ends up blowing up my signal. So you have this peak to the signal. So you have this peak to the signal that shows up here. And of course, here you then have your decline. Right? So if, for example, you wanted to, uh, you know, you were designing a filter to have this sort of narrow band characteristic where you have this, this notch or peak, you could do that with Bode plots. All you would have to do is you would take your filter and you would essentially um, re reduce the value of sigma. Okay, so if I've made it 0 0.001, this would be an even sharper peak because it's more dependent on omega. All right, so now in general, if you wanna design filters, uh, if you think about poles, what they've done is the poles are a low pass filter. So a single pole filter is a low pass filter. What do you think a filter with single or double zeros is? Well, zeros are the opposite of poles. So as you would imagine, if I have a single zero filter, for example, H of S just equals, let's say S, you know, some function like S minus three or whatever, uh, then I'm gonna have the opposite. I'm gonna essentially, I'm gonna start at a low value. So say that a single zero like H of S equals S squared or whatever. Now, as when S is zero uh, at the DC component and J omega is zero, you're gonna have nothing being passed, but as J omega starts to increase, I'm gonna start to pass, pass more and more frequencies. Now, this is sort of getting at almost like a high pass filter, except it's not bounded. So if I look at the, uh, the plot here, let's look at H of S, let's look at S, it's just gonna be increasing without bound, right? So this is not really a high pass filter, because ideally a high pass filter looks something like this. You may increase here, but eventually you roll off and you have a pass band. So what you can do instead is you can effectively you can put zeros, so you can, you can have a, a filter with a zero here. So you can have a zero near omega equals zero near the origin, and that would cause your transfer function to rise. And then when you want the transfer function to essentially level out, you would put, well, you would put a pole here. You could put a pole here at this cutoff frequency, which could be 100 hertz. You can put a pole here, which will actually cause this to flatten out. So in this way, we can use zeros and poles to kind of design filters and Bode plots give us an intuitive way to represent this, uh, both in terms of the, sh the shape of the curves as well as the slope of the curves. Both of these characteristics are very important for electronics and filter design. I realize that this is kind of a short lecture. Bode plots are not really in the full curriculum of WE102, but I just wanted to introduce you to that in case you see it in uh, other classes as you advance. Uh, speaking of things that are not on the topic of W102, the last one I'll touch on is multidimensional signal processing, in other words, imaging. Uh, it turns out that imaging, or cameras, optics, microscopes, telescopes, LIDAR for self-driving cars, imaging is just like acoustics, it's also a signal processing field. Uh, 
it's a very fundamental signal processing field where signals and systems is truly ingrained in one images. So let me show you just a quick snapshot example. Imagine I have this scene. So I have a tree here and I have a, a man standing. And so this is a scene, right? So a scene is the real world and the dimensions of this are spatial coordinates, n1, n2, right? So you can think of this intuitively as a picture where you have grids of pixels and the pixels are parameterized in two dimensions, n1 and n2. Now, uh, in the real world, this is continuous. This n1 and n2 could be in centimeters or meters. It could mean the dimension of our real world. And what happens is that we have, for example, this scene that gets captured through some lens optics and then goes on to a CMOS chip. It goes on to an imaging sensor and it goes into an analog to digital converter, which actually reads that out. And then we pass this through a computer. So we store this on our computer hard disk as an image. And this is a computer and here's your mouse. So this is a computer that stores the image on the hard disk. And here we can do some manipulations to the image. We could you know, airbrush it, we could tone map it, we could change the color to black and white or whatever. And once we're done with that, we can go ahead and again, go through a digital to analog converter, which could be effectively one uh, the, the cable that goes and converts uh, the image to your monitor. Okay, and then it gets displayed to the monitor or display. And then it reaches, this is the human eye. So this is the signal chain for imaging. And it's actually very similar to uh, sound, right? Instead of a light, we have sound that goes into a microphone that gets digitized. So this is imaging. And on the other hand, we also have sound. For example, I could have uh, some sound waves, somebody speaking, right? That goes into a microphone has a wire here, which then goes and digitizes it. This can then go into, once again, a computer, for example, to process the vocal track. Then we're gonna convert this again to DAC. Instead of a monitor, now we have a speaker. So we have a speaker. And of course, we have now the human ear. So exactly the same analysis happens. Sound is typically you know, a signal of voltage over time. Here in imaging, the signal is a little different. The signal is uh, multidimensional. It's uh, space. So instead of LTI systems that we deal with in sound, we deal with LTI systems, linear time invariant. It turns out that actually imaging systems are what are called linear space invariant, LSI systems. A lot of the math is exactly the same as what we discussed in this class, except instead of single integrals for convolution, you have double integrals for convolution. Uh, if you're doing LIDAR, you have 3D imaging, so you have triple integrals for convolution. So, the ideas are almost exactly translatable. So if you master LTI systems, you can quickly apply that to problems in imaging, like what I spoke about in the beginning of the lecture with that COVID-19 project to estimate vital signs remotely. So uh, most of all, thank you so much for the class. I really enjoyed uh, this class as best as I could. Uh, you guys have really good cheer and uh, really took the pandemic and uh, protests and everything else that was going on in complete stride. So I thank you so much for your attention and look forward to meeting you on campus in coming years.